It's KUGN's Ask a Physician. Ask a Physician is an educational program only. We do not give medical advice. The information we provide is not a substitute for professional care from your personal health care provider and is not to be used for diagnosing or treating a specific medical condition or disease. If you know you have or think you may have a health problem, you should consult your personal health care provider. Now, Doc Talk on KUGN News Talk 590. Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday. We've been saying that all morning long, August the 14th. Oh, how time flies. It's 817 now, and it is, of course, another edition of Doc Talk Tuesday. Dr. Jeff Simmons in studio this morning, and good morning, sir. Good morning. It's a pleasure again. Well, it's always a pleasure to have you, and a very special guest in Tony Ballinger, and he is the Senior Director of Surgical Services at Sacred Heart Medical Center, also a nurse. Good morning, Dr. Ballinger. Uh, good morning. How are you? Good. I just called you doctor. That's okay. <laughs> okay. You told me. I always have great grand you know, tell by him. the end of the, uh, end of the oh, day, there's been be worse. The, uh, chief yeah. of surgery, I'm sure. You will. <laughs> He's been called worse. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, I either do that or I down. I think I called um, police chief uh, Pete Kearns, you know, Sergeant Kearns at one point, and, you know, an <laughs> officer or so-and-so sergeant. And so it just happens that way. But good morning. Glad to have you as well. Oh, it's great to be here. All right. So, Dr. Jeff, we're going to be focusing on um, surgical services at Sacred Heart Medical Center. Should we just kick it off right away? And uh, However you want to go. Let's do it. I, okay. Because yeah. uh, you had a question about strokes, and so I didn't know if you wanted to go there first or later. I would like later. to go there first. Would you? Okay. Sure. Let's do that. Because what happened is earlier this week we got a, an email from somebody that says, you know, there are uh, certain... Certain ways to really tell if indeed you are having a stroke. Well, I had gone camping with a a bunch of friends a couple of weeks ago, families, and a a gal did get off balance and she actually fell. And then when I read this about strokes, you can actually fall and you think, oh, it's nothing. It was just the rocks and the twigs and the slippery sandals. Mm -hmm. But however, that could be the first sign of somebody having a stroke is a, is a, a simple, a fall. Yeah. Well, the initials they use are the first three initials of stroke which is S, and that's ask the person to smile. Mm-hmm. That means they can move both sides of right. their mouth. Ask the person to talk or speak, and you, that's simple. You know, what's your name, if nothing else? And the third thing is to raise both arms. That's the R part of it. and um, Or stick out your tongue, which is a new uh, thing, and if it deviates to one side or the other. When it comes to something like this, is is very interesting, is you better make sure they speak English because they may not understand what you're talking about. This is true. And so you can still look for the droop in the mouth, but what you can do is the international sign where you give them the two fingers, one from each hand, like your index finger, okay. and it's normal for people to reach, grab hold of them like, like an udder on a cow. Uh-huh. And so uh, usually you can see that type of motion when they can't speak English or they're deaf or there's been an explosion and they're deaf. But uh, those are the main things to look for. And then you have this three-hour window and some people think it's even six, but three-hour window to give them a, a medicine that will break the clot, dissolve the clot. And we do a CAT scan real quick and find out if it is a stroke. And then we try to dissolve it. And uh, that has progressed a lot in the last few years. And the stroke can be so devastating, and to have it reversed is just incredible. But for a simple fall, to uh, ch- I mean, we didn't even, you know, are you okay? And, oh, yes, everything's yeah. fine. And she, you know, but I didn't even think about it. But I thought, wow, if her speech was slurry or her, you know, smile wasn't what it was, yeah. I, I, from now on, I will, if somebody falls down or or has a, you know, just it, a little, even be, admission. Yeah, it could be an injury to her mm-hmm. head, too, that's different than a stroke. You know, general terms might call it a stroke, but mm-hmm. there's something called a subdural hematoma and, and other things that movie star Richardson she died because she hit a special artery that mm-hmm. split, and it's typical they stand up and say they're fine, and then two hours later it's crashed. Wow. And she could have been saved if somebody was watching for that, but it's such an unusual scenario that sure. I don't think anybody can be blamed for it. But anyway, so that answers your email. It certainly does answer the email. And what yeah. are the initials again? Just the beginning of stroke, S-T-R. S-T-R, uh, all right. Smile, talk, and... Uh, Sort of reach raise, out or yeah. raise, yeah. All and right. so, yeah, and just make sure they speak English. Very good. <laughs> and they can hear. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, those things get in the way. Anyway, I've known Tony for a long time. We've been on some committees together, and and uh, he's been involved in the surgery unit for a long time, involved in a lot of innovations. The old unit at River at, at downtown University District and now River Bend. So about how many uh, surgical procedures now are performed at Sacred Heart? Uh, roughly 16,000 a year. Wow. 16,000. 
Yeah, I had no idea. How many a day? You know. Um, when we first moved in four years ago, it wasn't uncommon to do a hundred procedures uh, in a day. Uh, but now we're down to 65, 70. Uh, there's just con- been a continued migration to outpatient surgery centers. A hundred in a day. Can I ask a question here? How, no. So one surgeon would do how many? <laughs> um, it just depends on the type of procedure and how long they take. Um, we've put a lot of efficiencies in place around total joint procedures. Sure. And uh, our surgeons can do eight of those in a day. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, and they do it with separate hands. You know, yeah. just do one left hand, one right yeah, hand. Right. And just... Two at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so what are the most common ones that that you see? Uh, the most common, we do a lot of total joint replacement, a lot of spinal fusion, a lot of general surgery, colorectal, uh, vascular surgery, um, GYN surgery, both for cancer and what they call benign or just standard GYN procedures. Really, we do everything with the exception of transplants, and we do a lot of everything. We have a trauma. large medical staff. We have a too. lot of trauma. Yeah. We're a level two trauma center. That is amazing. 16,000 surgeries a year, up to 100 a day. I had no idea the number was that large either. The suites are beautiful. They uh, really are. Yeah, they don't allow internists in there, so I... So you have to stay out. <laughs> I, there's a <laughs> sign. You coming, sign they, they says internists stay out. We but I, I saw the units when they were giving tours, and I was just so impressed with... How, how much better are the units uh, here versus the old place? Uh, well, we're uh, we're set up a little differently. We're set up, organized by pods according to specialty, so any supplies you might need are in that four-room pod specific to the type of surgery you're doing. So, what other differences are there from Sacred Heart at University District to the Riverbend uh, facilities? Uh, in the Riverbend facility, uh, specific to the surgery suites, the technology is built into the room. So the monitors hang from the ceilings, the booms hang from the ceilings, and everything's interconnected. So if uh, someone wanted to teach a room full of interns or residents about a procedure, they could be in a conference room and we could beam the surgery out to them and he could talk to them. Um, the lab can see direct, he can see the specimen, specimen in the lab or they can talk to the surgeon directly. So a lot of it is around communication, ease of communication, and access to information. Wow. So it's much easier for the surgeons as well. I mean, you have nothing but the updated stuff. Yes. They can look at any um, CT scan or MRI uh, directly on a monitor in front of them. They don't have to. They don't have to touch it. No. So that cuts down on contamination by by far. Yeah, I was so impressed when I went through there, and and I'm not a surgeon. Um, Many procedures are done minimally invasive. What does that mean? Well, it's just a small incision or single incision, and we can do that, a technology that helps us do that as the magnification, um, putting cameras and scopes inside you. So minimizing the amount of tissue disruption, which speeds healing time, gets you out of the hospital quicker and lowers your pain. Now, is this different at Riverbend than it was at Sacred Heart Medical Center in the university district? Is We were doing a lot of procedures minimally invasively already. That's been the trend uh, in surgery. Uh, it's easier because of the technology we have. We don't have to wheel big uh, carts in. Uh, mm-hmm. We just we have it all in the room. We can plug into anything. You have a good example. I mean, in my day, which uh, goes back to the Roman era, I've mentioned that before, we would make an incision for a gallbladder that was from the sternum to the flank, and they'd be in the hospital for seven days and mm. home for six weeks with pain and not feeling well and on strong meds, and it was just awful. Now they come in and they do a scope, and they leave the same day, maybe the next day, but usually the same day, have a bandage, barely need pain medicines, and they do as well or better. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible. And it's true with a lot of other types of surgery. They're even doing scopes with open hearts. Uh, Yes, we are. And so uh, the the incision is smaller. They're out quicker. Complication rate is less. You know, I sometimes wonder, uh, all our new surgeons are going to just know how to do scopes. What happens if they get one of these old-fashioned problems and it can't be fixed with a scope? Do they know how to do them? Uh, that's actually discussed quite a bit. Is it? Um, and there's still enough open surgery. Um, and, and a lot of times it's minimally invasive, but they still have to go in and do the same, you know, the same sewing. There's the same uh, procedure. It's just done through different uh, avenues. So, yeah, yes. that is a concern, and it is discussed frequently. And and then, then there's robotic-assisted surgery. You know, when you say that, somebody envisions a robot coming, walking in, from a science fiction movie with a scalpel in one hand and a whatever equipment in the other hand. But it's really not that at all. You want to tell them what it is? Sure. That's that's probably the next generation robotic surgery where we can all just stay home and they'll handle it for us. Right. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, we utilize the robot um, for cardiac surgery is one of the unique areas we use it in for a mitral valve replacement or valve repair or intracardiac tumors. 
what it does is uh, the surgeon sits at a console right next to the patient and the robot arms are in the patient and there's an assistant at the field. Um, they're allowed to have much better visualization because of a camera, much better magnification, and the robot accounts for any tremors uh, the surgeon may have so they can do much more precise sewing and uh, procedural things. Their fingers are in uh, these little pockets and allow them to move around and the, the robot arms have little wrists on them and they can actually turn more than the human wrists so they're able to sew much tighter suture lines than they could previously. Now yeah. robotic assisted surgery, did, did doctors or surgeons have to go back to school when this was all? They do. They have to uh, go to a, a training course and then have to be proctored on a number of procedures. Uh, it was actually developed by the military so that surgeons could be in a safe area and uh, surgery could be performed uh, downrange. Uh, oh. But it's actually transferred quite nicely into the civilian sector. But you have to probably have a surgeon standing by just in case something goes wrong. Don't well, the you? surgeon is in the room. And, yeah. you know, we have had that where they have to convert to open if there's a mm -hmm. lot of scar tissue and they just simply step scrub up. in and step up to the table. And there's an assistant there that has everything ready to go. So How yeah. hard is it for them to learn this? Um, it... it uh, they make it look easy, of course. I'm sure it's hard. The basics of surgery remain the same, the basic uh, things they're worried about and concerns they have. It's just a matter of uh, getting used to, you know, visually. You know, they have a training console that they can practice on. So We're in the middle of a Doc Talk Tuesday with Dr. Jeff Simmons in studio along with Tony Ballinger. He's the Senior Director for Surgical, Surgical Services at Sacred Heart. Our phone lines are open for you, 541-686-0590. Any questions that you might have for either one? And uh, John is on the line with a question. Good morning, sir. Hi, Doc. Good morning. Did I just hear right that you could be out of out of a surgery ward and still do surgery, like uh, like around the world, or like not even be there? And you know, is that is that what you guys were ta referencing as far as being remote on a robot? Uh, it's a possibility. We don't do that. The surgeon remains in the room at our facility, and I believe most facilities. But the technology would certainly allow for that sometime in the future. Yeah, they're talking about third world countries being able to be helped by Germany or something. You know. Uh, that's a little science fiction, but it's probably going to all come true. Isn't that crazy? It's amazing. It Thanks, is Dr. amazing. Thank you, John. Thanks for the call. 541-686-0590. It is the Doc Talk Tuesday. It is time for us to take a short break. You gather your thoughts and questions. Write this number down, 541-686-0590. And give us a call. First one through. We'll be the first one out during, after the break. We are in the middle of a Doc Talk Tuesday here on KUGN News Talk 590. It's Doc Talk on KUGN News Talk 590. Welcome back to a Doc Talk Tuesday. In studio with us, Dr. Jeff Simmons and Dr. Tony Ballinger with Sacred Heart Medical Center. Dr. Ballinger is the Senior Director of Surgical Services at Sacred Heart. And, of course, Dr. Jeff, internal medicine physician. 541-686-0590 is the number to call with your comments or questions. And joining us now on the line is Betty. Good morning, Betty. Good morning down there. Good morning to the doctors. Good morning. I have I, I uh, subscribe to a Consumers Reports newsletter. And they're telling us that we should not be taking calcium because it is bad for our heart. I'd like to have your opinion on that. Well, I get that same uh, periodical. And this is in controversy right now. Is There is some thought that the supplemental calcium doesn't work the same way as the calcium in your food. Okay. And so that, that when you're taking a supplement, especially when you're taking a big load of it, like two grams or one gram of it, uh, or Tums, that when that big load hits, if there's any place susceptible to picking it up, like an injured blood vessel, it may pick it up. Now, this is the thinking. This isn't pr proven. Uh, it will pick it up, so it'll add to the blockage. Okay. And so uh, stick. they're saying stick to normal calcium foods, and you can go online and get a whole list of them, and dairy products right. are, are up there. If you're a lactose intolerance, then you've got to scramble a little bit for uh, calcium in, in your diet. It's not proven, but we do know that calcium is in the thrombus that blocks off a blood vessel. And so, I mean, there's some logic to it, but I, I have not seen the proof. Very good. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Betty, for the call. We appreciate it, and thanks for being there. We are KUGN News Talk 590 in the middle of a Doc Talk Tuesday with Tony Ballinger. He is the director of surgical services at Sacred Heart. He is also a nurse. We've got Dr. Jeff Simmons in studio with us, the internal medicine physician, and we're talking about surgery and surgical services at Sacred Heart at Riverbend. Yeah, Tony mentioned uh, when we were off the air uh, a new procedure that's coming, which I also find very interesting. When somebody has the aortic valve problem, which is the fourth valve before it goes out into the aorta, uh, it, that can be fatal as it closes up and gets hard. And so it's a big surgery to open up the chest and replace it. And now they're, they've got a way to go with uh, catheters. And I'll have them talk about it. And curious about the mortality, morbidity on that. Uh, yeah, it's called the uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, and we're getting ready to do. We've been doing a lot of training and testing uh, with our cardiac surgery team, and it enables you to just travel through a blood vessel and deploy a new valve. That is amazing. Uh, and years ago, I mean, this was something that was fatal years ago, right? Yes. And today they're in and out, what, in a day? Uh, we don't know yet. Okay. They can be. Uh, the The biggest advantage right now, we're only doing it uh, on very select patients. Uh, mm-hmm. It's still in its infancy, but uh, you don't have to open the chest. You don't have to go on the heart-lung bypass. Yeah, well, this problem was fatal if you didn't treat it, and it was almost fatal if you did. And uh, not almost, but, I mean, it was very serious. This it promises to be an excellent option. It will be very interesting to see what happens. 541-686-0590 if you have any calls or questions for the doctors. Let's welcome in Sam. Good morning, Sam. Hi, Sam. Sam's not there. Sam, are you there? Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, Sam calls back. I see that he's on hold, but um, something's wrong with our I think back. he was going to ask, what trends have you seen since you noticed <laughs> your Have you noticed during your career? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the biggest trend we've noticed is in the decrease in length of stay. Uh, that's sort of, uh, it's been compounded by the migration of patients that used to stay one or two nights in the hospital, moving to outpatient surgery centers or going home the same day from the hospital. Um, so our length of stay has remained uh, relatively stable because we've seen sicker and sicker patients coming into the hospital with more uh, complexities. So that's it's offset somewhat by the outpatient surgery centers, which is a good and healthy thing. If it can be done in an outpatient setting, it should be. Um, but that's probably the biggest thing is getting people out of the hospital quicker. Sure. Okay, well, we're going to try it once again. Oh, I hear him. Hey, Sammy uh, there. Hello. Hi. Go ahead with your question. Yeah, uh, My question is, I don't know if it's true or not, but I've heard that a lot of surgery is done with like obsidian knives versus a metal plate because they can make a fine. I was just curious if that's any validity to that. I, I get it. I yeah. know. You're breaking up a little bit. You know, we didn't get that, Sam. Can you just uh, say one Hello? more time? We'll try one more time. Give us a question. Okay. Are you there? Yep. Give us a question one more time. Okay. I was. Somebody told me that a lot of surgical blades are made with obsidian versus metal because they can get a finer edge when oh. they break the blade out of the obsidian oh. glass. All right. I think we got the question now. I've, I've heard of that. Uh, they're, they're quite expensive. Uh, we don't routinely use them. I mean, um, we use specialty blades and things like eye surgery, um, but we don't routinely use obsidian blades in uh, oh. surgery. All right, there you go. A little trivia question there for you. All right, so moving on with the surgical services at Sacred Heart Medical Center at Riverbend. So what are the benefits of having now changed from the old UD hospital to the Riverbend? Uh, Numbers of patients, uh, less complications, uh, shorter stays, things like that? Uh, Shorter stay and just overall increased communication. We we have something called the Smart Track uh, boards that we use, so... Um, not just the surgeons, but patients' family can know what stage their loved one is at. Oh, that's right from home yeah. or from your car or from now home, from your phone. Or they don't have to sit right in the waiting room. Uh, they can look at a monitor. They have a, a number that they're issued so no patient information is uh, breached, and they can go have a cup of coffee and know you know, when to be back, and the physician is going to want to talk to them. And also a physician can know if they're following another physician or assisting. They can get online and see where we're at in the procedure. It just saves everyone a lot of time and reduces a lot of phone calls and frustration. Yeah, you can sit in the cafeteria and watch the names and uh, or the numbers. I don't know how you guys code it or what because it's got to be private, mm-hmm. but you can see what's going on in general terms. I, I think the whole field of medicine is changing. The things that we're seeing in internal medicine were things that we always treated in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the hospitals are taking care of the worst of the worst, and the stuff that we used to see in the hospital are now a lot of them outpatient or scopes, and they're out the same day. Uh, a hernia operation 
if they do one. So it's arguable if you should do one sometimes. I mean, you're in and out in a few hours. Eye surgery, years, years ago, um, you could be in for three days with eye surgery uh, with a patch over your eye and all kinds of stuff. And now it's a 10-minute procedure, like a dentist almost, in and out. It's amazing what's changing with surgery and with lasers. You guys using lasers? Uh, we use a variety of lasers. We use them in just about every specialty. Um, like how? Different yeah. wavelengths. We use them certainly in eye surgery. We use them in uh, genitourinary surgery to blast uh, kidney stones. Um, we use them uh, CO2 lasers for ENT procedures to take care of throat lesions. Um, they've made their way into quite a few specialties. So if I'm a patient and I'm kind of nervous about all this, uh, and I know I have an upcoming surgery, what's going to happen to me as I sign in or I do the preoperative stuff? What uh, Can you give us kind of a guide to all that? Sure. If it's an elective procedure, you're seeing in the pre-anesthesia clinic and you meet with an anesthesiologist to go over any specialty uh, or special situations you might incur or um, if you have any detailed questions, your lab work will be drawn. Any tests uh, necessary will be ordered. What does that happen, about a week before, two uh, weeks Roughly prior? a week before. Okay. Um, if you're having like a joint replacement, there's a joint camp uh, you go to to learn. You know, Teaching is so important to know what to do. It really is. I went through that, and I have to say you guys did such a great job preparing uh, me for a joint replacement. It was amazing because, you know, you go into something like that, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what to do prior or after. And the things you can do prior to surgery can make it so much better, life so much better after. And I think aren't they showing up in the morning of surgery now instead of staying overnight? Yeah, it's very uncommon for someone to come in and check into a hospital the night before. That used to be very commonplace. They would check in, and it was just an unnecessary expense, and they didn't get a good night's sleep. They're not in their own bed. Um, yeah. No, I like that idea. So you do the pre-appointment with the anesthesiologist, and then what happens? Uh, then they show up the morning of surgery, most generally, and they're checked in, um, put in a room. Uh, the nurse physician comes and marks the site. Uh, that's relatively new. They mark the site to reduce the chance of wrong site surgery. The nurse comes in and uh, double checks and verifies that. Anesthesia comes in. We get an IV started, and you're taken back to the room. Um, and from there, you go to the recovery room and then back to either be discharged home or up to the nursing floor. And uh, to be discharged home, that's basically when you can, you know, your body functions are working and you can walk. Is that pretty much? Uh, different criteria for different types of surgery. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's uh, we want you to be able to go to the bathroom. Right. Uh, we want you to be able to ambulate uh, mm -hmm. without chance of falling. Or we don't want to, to complicate things further by having someone take a fall if sure. they're still okay. not yeah. quite with it. We have another call. We do. 541-686-0590 with your comments or questions. Let's welcome in Fred. Good morning, Fred. Hey, hey Doc, can you talk about procedures like to stop leaving stuff in people? You know, like when the operator, has that changed or what? You kind of want to, yeah, I've heard of, you know, like sponges or stuff being left in. And, and how bad is, like, those infections now with this new laser stuff surgery? Is that worse as far as getting uh, surgical infection? I'll, I'll just listen on about it. Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit, but I think I get the point. Uh, do we have instruments left in? You see that on TV all the time with shows and stuff like that. And uh, the infection rate is a concern always. It's a, that's monitored commonly because that's the one big thing that you don't, among big things, that you don't want to have happen. And so they're very attentive to that, but Tony can address it. Yeah, we've, uh, we, we are part of a national program to monitor infections and um, to standardize how, how and when antibiotics are administered uh, prior to surgery and uh, we give our patients uh, HibaCleanse sponges to wash themselves prior to surgery, and then the morning of, we do it again. And one thing you don't see anymore is the shaving, which we found really disrupted the skin and uh, increased the chance of infection. So now hairs are clipped, if at all. Uh, surgeons are just getting used to sewing through the hair and finding out it's reducing the infection rate. So those numbers are reported nationally, and uh, soon will be hospitals will be reimbursed based on their infection rate. So it's pay for performance. So oh, very good. Everybody falls in line and does it uh, the correct way. With regard to retained objects after surgery, uh, we count all of our instrumentation. That's becoming the standard. We've been doing it for some time. So every instrument that's used is counted. All the sponges are counted. Um, what we see in some very uh, instrumentation-specific surgeries, orthopedic surgery and neurosurgery, is new sets all the time with little washers and screws. And so it, it um, becomes increasingly complex. Everything has to be counted and inventoried and accounted for. 
Um, if there's any question, if the count isn't correct, then the patient is x-rayed and sent to a radiologist so we can determine nothing's left, been left in. But I've in real life, it can happen. It's not just um, extreme on TV. You read no. about it, but I've never had it happen in my practice. It continues to happen nationwide, um, even with all the, the counting and the new counting procedures. We're continually looking at that and updating it, um, taking our our lead from places like the Mayo Clinic who do a very high volume of procedures, but it still happens. Sure. We have another call. We do. Let's welcome in Jim. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. I was wondering, listening to you guys, if the uh, if uh, instruments like the Da Vinci machine have been significant contributors to the in and out uh, without the overnight stays because it's less intrusive. And the second part of that is I understand that they're also significantly less expensive than a lot of the uh, other operating equipment. Um, the Da Vinci machine is is expensive. It's a large capital outlay, and uh, but we have seen with select procedures. It's it's not really a, a hammer looking for a nail. There are certain procedures that have been proven it can decrease your length of stay. So even while the procedure may cost more upfront, if you're staying in the hospital you know, one day as opposed to three, then there is a cost savings overall. Now, you guys did talk about the Da Vinci um, procedure. Robot, or yeah. robot, okay, yeah. right, earlier. Can you kind of refresh those that are just joining us about what that is? Sure. The Da Vinci is, is currently its its ubiquitous term for the robot. They don't really have a competitor yet. Um, on the market, there's a company in Canada that's developing one. So all the robots in America and around the world are generally um, the Da Vinci brand. So that's just the term that's used. Uh, the surgeon sits at a console in the operating room and with 3D vision uh, looking into a uh, set of goggles has just wonderful visualization. Uh, the camera is in the patient, and there are assistants at the field uh, that can change the robot arms if he needs a stapler or a cutter or um, some needle holders to sew with. Um, the assistants take care of all that, and then the surgeon just does the, the fine motor skills that the Da Vinci allows him from the console. It re- removes all the tremor and uh, gives them a little more agility that the uh, human wrist doesn't possess. Da Vinci doesn't have to break for bathroom or pass out when it sees blood. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's the beauty of the robot. They don't take breaks and they they don't take holidays. Yeah, yeah and right. he had a second part to his question about the cost on the Da Vinci. Yeah, how expensive is that if I say I want to go the other way? I mean, do you have a choice? Do you have a, a choice? Uh, you do, absolutely. Oh, okay. And and not all procedures. Uh, some people will read about it and come in and ask that their procedure can be done with a robot, and it just doesn't apply to all procedures. Um a lot of uh, GYN procedures, cardiac procedures, um, and urology procedures um, are a great application for it. Uh, they have applications for orthopedics, but we take a look at all that pretty thoughtfully with our surgeons and decide if it's an improvement for us or not, if the added expense up front is worth it. I think it. we should be very proud of our hospital because this is state-of-the-art. Oh, absolutely. I mean, here we are in little old Eugene, and we really are right up there with the best. Mm-hmm. And we really have good docs to boot. There really are very few that would be considered even close to mediocre. I mean, we have a lot of very superb docs Absolutely. operating. And it, it, the worst of things can happen to the best of guys sometimes. It's just bad luck. But most cases, what's your complication rate? Uh, less than 5%? No, I would say. Yeah. Very that's, good. Yeah, that's good. That is amazing. All right, folks. Well, we are in the middle of a Doc Talk Tuesday. We've got one more break to take. If you have any questions... Or I uh, just want to comment on anything with Tony Ballinger, Senior Director of Surgical Services at Sacred Heart, or Dr. Jeff Simmons, Internal Medicine Physician, here in the middle of a Doc Talk Tuesday. Give us a call at 541 686 0590. About 10 minutes left in the program. It is 849 now at KUGN. It's Doc Talk on KUGN News Talk 590. our last segment for August the 14th, Tuesday Doc Talk, with Dr. Jeff Simmons and Tony Ballinger, who is a Senior Director for Surgical Services at Sacred Heart, also a nurse at Sacred Heart Medical Center. This has been just a, an interesting, interesting program. It always is. Learn so much, and there's uh, so much going on out at Sacred Heart River Bend. And I tell you what, Jeff, you were saying that uh, state-of-the-art and great docs, I think we're very blessed. Yeah, we are very lucky. I think Eugene is attracted. Uh, good docs. There's been a lot of competition for space, and so as a consequence, uh, people have been weeded out who might be questionable or uh, limited in what they can do. And so I, there's a number of docs that if I was sick and in the emergency room, if they walked in because they were on call, 
you know, I wouldn't just jump off the stretcher and run out of the hospital. I may say, great. Sure. And like you say, when it comes to surgeries, we were talking about uh, 100 a day, 16, what, thousand a year. Um, and a number of surgeons for each particular... <laughs> particular different kind just, of surgery? Just a second, Dr. Jeff. What are those doctors' names that you would you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'll you tell you off the air. I'll get sued if they're otherwise. <laughs> they're very few and far between, let we'll me tell you. Scoop, you know, it's nice interesting. Try. It's interesting. Many years ago, you could be drunk, you could be, you know, almost anything, and you, you had hospital privileges. But nowadays, we have so many things that check on doctors, their skills, double check. Uh, you have to have so much education. Uh, we weed out... A lot. The docs that come to a town like this with these peer review things, I, they won't come. They'll go off to some small town where they so desperately need a doctor. You know, they'll take you know anybody almost. I was going to tell you about an experience of mine is that I had surgery a, a lot of years ago, and the, one thing that concerned me was privacy. And it wasn't a kind of surgery that was a big deal, not at all. But I just kind of a nut for privacy, and right. so when I arrived at the hospital, the person who checked me in was my patient. The person who took me back for my x-ray was my patient. The person who took my x-ray was my patient. Wow. Then I checked in again. It was my patient. And then I went into a room, and the nurse taking care of me was my patient. And guess what? It was a two-person room, and the other person was my patient. Oh. I said, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! Yeah, and so I yeah, and then I, when my wife wheeled me out in a wheelchair, I said, "I bet we run into three of my patients." Well, we ran into two, and so so it was a good thing it wasn't any really secret operation. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but oh. we tried it. We tried desperately to keep things private. Mm-hmm. You know, people have code numbers and uh, uh, single rooms, and uh, that's a very important issue. In fact, we have our own sheriff, in a sense, who mm-hmm. monitors privacy on the on the computers and elsewhere. Very good, as it should be. Yeah. Five four one six eight six zero five nine zero. If you've got any questions, so um, what about looking ahead? Do you see? Are there any hopes and dreams of um, upcoming new technology to arrive at Riverbend? Yeah, there seems to be something new every week, um, and we get excited about it. We don't want to be early adapters. You know, we're not like the people in line at the Apple Store three days out for the <laughs> sure. new five uh, G phone. Uh, the latest thing that's coming. Uh, we're actually using it now and negotiating a price on uh, purchasing it this week. It's called the Super Dimension, and it allows uh, 3D computer-assisted navigation for lung tumors. Where it used to be you would have to deflate the lung, go in and excise the tumor to biopsy it and, and figure out how to treat it. We can now do that with uh, fine needle aspiration. Uh, it's a combination procedure done by the uh, pulmonologists, and they go home the same day. We don't have to drop the lung. There's no chest tube. We've been using it successfully and diagnosing and treating uh, lung cancer much less invasively and more effectively. Wow, isn't that something? Well, the skinny needle biopsy has really evolved over the last decade or more. I and mean, I used to have to like do a liver biopsy myself, and we would do it blindly, which is a long needle, and you kind of palpate where the liver probably is and hope that you don't get normal lung or normal kidney or something. And now you know they do that in radiology. It's not even a surgical procedure unless there's something going on that's unusual. So it's interesting. A lot of procedures that were in-hospital procedures are now outpatient. And as I mentioned earlier, they take care of the worst, the hardest, you know, cases of all and Mm -hmm. uh, and do a spectacular job. And it is always a battle against infection, uh, always, because these bacteria will adjust and then readjust. and, uh, And then antibiotics have been cut back. And uh, because of not wanting to create resistance, even medicines like a stomach protecting medicine is an infection, which we sometimes get, that if you keep the people on this acid lowering medicine, they'll get a, a bowel infection. That acid's there for a reason. So, you know, we keep improving, keep changing, keep learning. And it's not because we're making mistakes. It's because people are learning new things. And um uh, and we're on top of it. I really think this hospital is really on top of it. Absolutely. And talking about the new um, technology coming in, does it make procedures like that more expensive to patients? Actually, no. It uh, it lowers the expense because it lowers the amount of time they spend in the hospital. So mm-hmm. there's uh, usually some upfront costs associated with it, but then soon it becomes the standard of care and other things go by the wayside. Wow. The really first foray into the image-guided surgery was for brain surgery, mm-hmm. this is the stealth station technology, which we adopted probably 15 years ago. And they'll take an MRI or CT of your brain and then scan it into the computer, and the computer builds a 3D model of your brain. So instead of removing a large skull flap and going in and fishing around for a tumor, 
they can make a tiny little hole in your skull and go right in on top of the tumor and resect it and you know you go home much you know it's much less damage to the brain and you go home relatively quickly wow. so, so hmm. is medical school something completely different nowadays with this technology I would imagine yeah I if I had the liberty to do it I'd redo it uh, because well, yeah. I think so many things have changed sure you guys, this has been awesome. There we go. Grant gave me a little warning. <laughs> and there it is, just like that. Dr. Jeff Simmons, internal medicine physician at Sacred Heart Medical Center, Peace Health Medical Center. And Tony Ballinger, Senior Director of Surgical Services at Sacred Heart, our special guest this morning. We really appreciate you coming in with Dr. Jeff. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Hey, pleasure. Yeah, it's awesome. All right. Another Doc Talk. Underway, under wraps. We're done. We're out of here, Grant. Under sheets. Yeah, there we go. That's it, <laughs> under sheets. I like it. Hey, make sure to stay tuned today at 3 o'clock. The uh, Geraldo Show, new to the Cajun lineup on today. Mike Huckabee is next. For Storm Kennedy, I'm Grant Mackey. Have a great Tuesday. Until tomorrow morning at 5.30.